Welcome everyone to this video by Learn Civil Engineering, where we will be working through the technique for calculating the hydrostatic load on a vertical end wall for a continuously stratified liquid. This video follows on from principles learnt in previous videos, so I'll leave the links to these in the description, and if you don't understand the fundamentals of what I'm doing at any point in this video, you can go and check out the respective video going into more detail. So, to start off, Consider the situation shown here in the diagram of a uniform rectangular tank containing a continuously stratified liquid with a density distribution of rho with respect to depth h equals rho naught plus rho h minus rho naught divided by h naught times by h for h equals 0 to h equals h naught. Here, h naught is the uniform depth of the liquid inside the tank and rho naught and rho h denote the water densities at depths of h equals 0 and h equals h naught, respectively. And note that rho naught is less than rho h, i.e. the density of the liquid increases with depth h. The tank is open and the liquid's free surface is exposed to the atmosphere. The base and sidewalls of the tank are planar surfaces, with the base being horizontal and the four sidewalls being vertical. The tank has a length of L, and a width of w, and the coordinate directions x, y, and z are defined as shown, relative to the bottom corner of the tank, with z denoting the vertical height above the tank's base, and x and y denoting the horizontal coordinates in the plane of the tank's base. Remember that h is related to z by h equals h naught minus z. With this information, and the techniques learnt in previous videos, we will now work through how to calculate the hydrostatic load, F, and its corresponding centre of pressure that acts on the end wall of the tank at Y equals L. And for this situation, we will find F and CP for the case when H0 equals 6.5 metres, W equals 12.5 metres, Rho0 equals 1000 kilograms per metre cubed, and Rho H equals 1115 kilograms per metre cubed. We will let S denote the region of the end wall surface that is in contact with the liquid, which has an area of A equals W H naught. That is, S consists of the points from X equals 0 to X equals W, Y equals L, and H equals 0 to H equals H naught. The end wall is vertical and has unit outward normal vector N is equal to negative J. Therefore, taking the equations we learnt in the introductory video to hydrostatic loads, we have the hydrostatic force F equals F times J, with the force F equals the surface integral of P with respect to A. Firstly, we will find the gorge pressure distribution in terms of depth H. dP by dH is equal to the density with respect to H times by G, and therefore we need to take the integral of dP by dH with respect to H. Substituting in our density distribution, we get the integral of rho naught plus rho h minus rho naught divided by h naught times by h, all times by g with respect to h. The integral of rho naught with respect to h is equal to rho naught h, and the integral of h with respect to h is equal to one half h squared. Therefore, the pressure at a depth of h is equal to g times by rho naught h plus rho h minus rho naught divided by 2 h naught times by h squared, plus some constant k. Then, applying the boundary condition that p equals 0 at h equals 0, we can see that k equals 0. Therefore, the pressure at a depth of h is equal to g times by rho naught h plus rho h minus rho naught divided by 2 h naught times by h squared from h equals 0 to h equals h naught. We find the magnitude of the load using f equals the surface integral of p with respect to a, and to evaluate this integral, we write dA equals dx dH, because it is the x and h coordinates that lie in the plane of the surface S, and then we integrate the product p with respect to x and h at all points on the surface S, which is just from x equals 0 to x equals w, and h equals 0 to h equals h naught. Therefore, our equation equals the integral of g 
times rho naught h plus rho h minus rho naught divided by 2 h naught times by h squared with respect to h from 0 to h naught, which is then multiplied by the integral of 1 with respect to x from 0 to w. We can factor g out of the integral, and then carrying out the integral, we get g times by 1 half rho naught h squared plus rho h minus rho naught divided by 6 h naught, all times by h cubed, with boundary limits of 0 and h naught, times by x with boundary limits of 0 and w. Substituting in our boundary limits, f is equal to g w times by 1 half rho naught h naught squared plus 1 sixth times rho h minus rho naught divided by h naught times by h naught cubed. We can factor h naught squared out of the brackets along with 1 over 6 to give us 1 divided by 6 times by g w h naught squared times by 3 rho naught plus rho h minus rho naught. And this simplifies to 1 over 6 g w h naught squared times by 2 rho naught plus rho h. Now, recall that the area at the end wall that is in contact with the liquid, A, is equal to w h naught. And so substituting this into our previous answer, f is equal to 1 over 6 times by 2 rho naught plus rho h times by g h naught a. In previous videos, where we found the hydrostatic load on a horizontal base and a vertical end wall with homogeneous liquid, we have already worked through the calculations for finding the centre of pressure in terms of the horizontal x-coordinate, even though you could determine it using intuition. In this video, we will just use our intuition, and by symmetry, we can tell that in terms of the x-coordinate, the centre of pressure, Cp, must lie along the vertical centre line of S. If you would like to see the manual calculations for determining this, the links for the previous videos will be in the description below for you to check out. To calculate the depth of Cp below the free surface, in terms of h, we will use moments about the free surface. With hp denoting the centre of pressure for the load f in terms of the coordinate direction h, and mx denoting the moment of f about the x-axis at the free surface of the liquid, we have mx equals hp f, and then using the hydrostatic pressure distribution, we can find mx by mx equals the surface integral of h times p with respect to a. Combining both of these, we get fhp equals the surface integral of h times p with respect to a. We can express this equation as the integral of h times p with respect to h from h equals 0 to h equals h naught, all integrated with respect to x from x equals 0 to x equals w. Substituting our pressure distribution in for p, and factoring g out of the integral, we have g times the integral of rho naught h squared plus rho h minus rho naught divided by 2 h naught times by h cubed with respect to h from 0 to h naught, and this is times by the integral of 1 with respect to x from 0 to w. The integral of h squared with respect to h is equal to 1 over 3 h cubed. The integral of h cubed with respect to h is equal to 1 over 4 h to the power of 4, and the integral of 1 with respect to x just equals x. And so, we get g times 1 third rho naught h cubed plus rho h minus rho naught divided by 8 h naught times by h to the power of 4, with boundary limits of 0 and h naught. And this is times by x with boundary limits of 0 and w. Substituting in the boundary limits results with g w times by one third rho naught h naught cubed plus one eighth times rho h minus rho naught times by h naught cubed. Factoring h naught cubed as well as one divided by twenty four out of the brackets, we get one over twenty four times g w h naught cubed times by 8 rho naught plus 3 times rho h minus rho naught. And finally, this simplifies to fhp equals 1 over 24 times g w h naught cubed times by 5 rho naught plus 3 rho h. 
Combining our equations for FHP and for the magnitude of the load F gives HP equals FHP divided by F, which is equal to 1 over 24 times by 5 rho naught plus 3 rho h times by g h naught squared a. And this is all divided by 1 over 6 times by 2 rho naught plus rho h times by g h naught a, which then simplifies to 5 rho naught plus 3 rho h times by h naught, all divided by 4 times by 2 rho naught plus rho h. So that then is the position of CP in terms of the depth h. But now let's substitute in our values from the start of h0 equals 6.5 meters, w equals 12.5 meters, rho0 equals 1000 kilograms per meter cubed, and rho h equals 1115 kilograms per meter cubed. With these values, the magnitude of the load F is equal to 1 over 6 times by 9.81 times 12.5 times 6.5 squared times by 2 times 1000 plus 1115 which is equal to 2690 kilonewtons and then HP equals 5 times 1000 plus 3 times 1115 times by 6.5 all divided by 4 times by 2 times 1000 plus 1115 which is equal to 4.35 meters. Therefore, we can conclude by saying the magnitude of the hydrostatic load acting on the vertical end wall, F, equals 2690 kilonewtons, and the center of pressure on S is located along the vertical center line of the surface at a depth of 4.35 meters. This result is intuitive because the pressure does not vary horizontally across S so we expect CP to be positioned along the vertical centerline of S. However, the pressure does vary vertically across S. In particular, there is greater pressure acting on the bottom of the surface than at the top. Hence, we expect CP to be positioned in the bottom half of S. So that then is how we can calculate the hydrostatic load on a vertical end wall and find the point of action of that load for a continuously stratified liquid. This has been a video by Learn Civil Engineering. If you have found this video useful at all, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to show your support. If you do have any remaining questions or would like me to cover a specific topic, please leave them in the comment section below and I will try to respond as soon as possible. Thank you for watching.